continue today, is on website accessibility. Um, the idea of website accessibility goes hand in hand with the original vision for the web. And that is the web as being something that's universal, something that people can access regardless of the hardware that they're using or where they are in the world or in the case of accessibility, any disabilities or differences in ability that they may have. Uh, we identified a couple key points. Um, first of all is that although blindness and, and visual related issues is certainly a big issue as far as accessibility goes, it's certainly not the other issue. And what we'll do today is we'll continue to identify some of those other issues. The other thing we identified was the notion of universal design. And the notion of universal design says that what we can do for people with disabilities will also help people that don't have those particular disabilities. Maybe all the time, maybe sometimes, but at the very least, um, the accommodations that we make won't interfere with people that don't have disabilities. And the example I gave from the physical world is Braille outside of the classroom. That may not necessarily help someone that, uh, that can see, but it's certainly not going to interfere with their ability to find the room. All right? Whereas other accommodations, such as a wheelchair ramp or an elevator, can actually help people, even if they don't have the disability, depending on the circumstance. And with the web and the accommodations that we do for accessibility, the same idea applies. There's two main tenets, sort of, in the, the area of universal design. And as we go through everything today, I want to consider these two things as we list the different disabilities and list what we can do to help people that have those. And those two main tenets are simplicity and multiple presentation. Simplicity, of course, relates to a lot of different things on the web. Not having too much content on a given page is an example of simplicity. Don't try to cram everything in. Leave plenty of space between things. Make sure that the font is uh, straightforward and readable. With these things, we can help people that are visually impaired to, to read. If everything isn't cluttered and there's sufficient space between things, people that have issues with reading can, uh, with issues with their vision and reading the material, can access it and understand it more, um, more easily. In addition to that, multiple presentations are things like using all the attributes, using description attributes and so on for um, the material on the web, most notably images. So we'll come back to these things as we go through. And we'll find, again, that universal design, for the most part, is just plain good design. All right, These ideas come into play. Uh, and, and or what constitute typically a well-designed web page uh, to begin with. So we started off last time with blindness. And we mentioned that in addition to the most severe versions of this disability, there are other less severe that could also have an impact. So blindness is the first one that we considered. But associated with blindness is simply people who are visually impaired. All right? uh, and this can include things such as color blindness, simply bad vision, and so on. As far as simplicity goes, as I mentioned, a page that isn't cr you know, crammed from edge to edge with content makes it easier for people to read. All right. 
a good, clear, simple font makes it easier to read. Multiple presentations, all the attributes. Maybe audio that goes along with the visuals. All right? And at the very least, don't do anything design-wise that makes it difficult for the assistive technology to assist people with the page. That was one other issue that uh, I forgot to mention in the, in the intro, is assistive technology is any hardware, software, or combination that uh, allows people to, with disabilities, access the web better. All right? Um, so a screen reader software, something that narrates the screen. Uh, with a simple design, the screen reader can typically do a better job. Now, we're going to learn some techniques later on for some specific situations that are a problem for screen readers, and we're going to talk about how to resolve them. All right? And we'll find that those things are, uh, will assist people using the assistive technology and won't interfere with people who don't use the assistive technology. All right, hearing. And again, we have on one end of the spectrum people that are totally deaf, but the rest of the spectrum is simply people that are hard of hearing. What can we do for those as far as simplicity or multiple presentation? All right, the transcript is a classic example. If we have an audio or a video presentation, we can have a transcript for it. That is, again, multiple presentations. We have the same content. Maybe it's an interview with someone, but we present it two different ways. One as a video clip, one as a transcript that's written down that people can look at and read. So that would be a great example of that. Yes? A volume wheel. A volume wheel? Yeah, absolutely. Usually that's, things like that are built into the computer, but sometimes even the uh, the audio player does. There's, there's actually multiple things, you know. There's, like, for example, if you go to YouTube, you can turn the volume up and down in YouTube, but you can also turn your computer's master volume up and down as well. So something like that's usually handled for you. But again, you could make sure that if you embed any uh, video or audio stuff, that it does give the ability to, uh, to turn on the volume. Closed caption would be another example. As far as simplicity goes, I'm not sure if simplicity is really relevant here. Uh, specific to hard of hearing. Um, in the one area I suppose it would be is don't put audio material on your page unless it adds something to it. All right? So don't put a bunch of audio or video clips on a page if it doesn't really add to the content. All right? Because again, people are going to wonder what they're missing if they can't access it some other way. And if you have that on top of transcripts, you're liable to clutter the page up. So put stuff on the page that really has an impact. Um, that can be effective as far as uh, web accessibility. What's another disability? Maybe one that we didn't talk about, or maybe we just mentioned it last time. <coughs> Okay, um, we'll, we'll call those uh, motor issues. Uh, we'll put that one up there too, because I think there's a little bit different situation between the two, but that's another, that's another good one as well. All right, people with motor issues, what can you do for them? What can you do to make your page more accessible for people that have trouble moving? First of all, the full range of things exist for mobility issues. There would be people that are completely paralyzed, that, that can't use their hands all right, at all. Um, and as we've seen, for the more severe cases, that's going to be where assistive technology is going to take over. Right, because in the more severe cases, you're going to have alternative pointing devices, like Stephen Hawking had, where he was able actually to move a pointer on a computer via a mouth. All right, um, 
for less severe ones, the, the assistive technology might be speech recognition. All right. For people that still had less, uh, less of an issue, they had more mobility, but their mobility was compromised, you might have things such as um, the ability to control the sensitivity of a mouse. All right. That would be uh, another thing that, that you could do. Or, or that's another piece of assistive technology that can help them. All right. There are keyboards uh, on screen that you can have. So instead of an actual physical keyboard, if someone has a hard time with their control of their fingers sufficient to type on a keyboard, you can use an on-screen keyboard where all you have to do is point and, and click to it if, they're cap if they have that capability. All right. So there's a lot of things as far as assistive technology first. But remember, bad design can defeat excess, uh, uh, assistive technology. Right? If you have a wheelchair to get around campus and there are wheelchair ramps, then your accessibility is going to be limited to certain places uh, on campus. Um, so what can we do from a design perspective for people that have mobility issues? Bigger buttons, bigger areas for the targets of links. Don't make them so small and close together. All right. Um, that would be one thing that we could do. All right. In addition to bigger buttons, maybe give sufficient space between buttons. All right. So that it's easier to point at one specific button instead of doing that. I have a problem like that when I get to my phone. Right. Because having fairly big hands, fairly big fingers, uh, to point and click on a link on my phone, very often I'm clicking the link that's immediately adjacent to it because it's just, you know, it's just hard for me to, to, to get that. So space between things, bigger targets is something that we can do. All right. What's something else that we could do? How can you save a document in Word without touching your mouse? Control S, all right. Keyboard shortcuts, all right. Keyboard shortcuts are for people who might have difficulty using a mouse, but are able to use a keyboard effectively. Again, when you think about mobility issues, there's a whole range, like I said before. On the one edge of the, the one extreme, you know, you're talking about people that are, that are paralyzed, that really have no ability. And for them, assistive technology is going to be probably the most critical. But then on the other end, you might have someone that has carpal tunnel. All right? It's not that they're paralyzed. It's not that they can't move. It's that they have an injury, and it's very difficult, and it's painful for them to do fine navigation of a mouse with their hand and wrist. So has anyone had carpal tunnel in here? Usually I have like maybe a couple people, one or two people per class uh, that, that have experienced it. And it can be very, very difficult, um, and it can be very painful. Uh, and in some, some cases, like using a brace can help or, or changing the, the style of your mouse can help. But in other cases, surgery is even required. Um, but simply doing things like giving a keyboard shortcut. Let's look up how we can accomplish a keyboard shortcut on our web page. I guess that would be a form of multiple presentation, right? you can access the material two different ways. You can either click on it or you can use a keyboard shortcut. Whereas having big targets to, to click on, space between targets, that would be an example of simplicity. Yes? You can make it easily tab through. You can make it easily tab through, exactly. The ability to use a keyboard instead of uh, the, uh, the mouse. For example, you, know, you might not realize, but on any page, if you notice as we tab through, Notice that we're getting a, I'm pointing to the screen, we're getting a little border around the item that's active. That's the active uh, uh, pseudo class on a link, by the way. So it's different than the hover. OK, now I'm getting started. And how do you click a link? With the space. Use the arrows to go down. So 
that was used to death using a, a border for that pseudo class? Well, as far as using a border for the pseudo class for active, um, you know, that was what makes sense for your design, right? You could use a border, a different color, you could change the color of the font. You know, it, it seems to work good in this situation, but, you know, yeah, you sort of have to judge. Um, and I would think probably a lot of the times, yeah, a border would be good. Um, let's look at a couple of things. Let's review the A active. <laughs> Thought I was pulling something off a diskette there. Okay, as I Oh, do I have to be clicking it? That's weird. I would have thought that it would have been if I just put my mouse. If I tab over it. That doesn't seem to be the case. So maybe it's not the, the active. It, it was, yeah, when I click on it, though. Um, that might be. Let's change it to hover. No, it's not that either. Repeat that, please. No, you just need to click run. I'm not sure what that represents then. At any rate, a link becomes active when you click on it. Okay, I, I stand corrected. That, that would not be the active. Um, but link, link highlighted when tabbed. How do I highlight an active tab? Oh, no, that's something else. also something else. All right, let's look up a uh, link keyboard shortcut. All right, here are the basic ones, but we can add those to our link. These are some ones that are sort of built into it, but access key. All right. So, for example, uh, Alt Command 1 will take us to this link. All right. So notice nothing up my sleeves, not using the mouse. Start learning HTML is Alt or Command 2, depending on whether you're on a Mac or a PC. So, boom, that takes you to that page. All right. The way you accomplish that is you say access key equals 1, 2, or 3. Yes. A focus? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
So let's go back to here. Um, there we go. Thank you. Excellent. So that would be a good cue to have in there as well. And you could you could do a lot of things with it. You could use the border and all that. The idea is, is again, and this isn't even just for people with disabilities. Some people, like people that are like really, really um, keyboard savvy, you know, their 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 hands never touch the mouse, right? They do everything via commands. I I don't know. I I feel I have to conserve space in my brain, so I don't remember keyboard shortcuts, right? Uh, I probably should, <laughs> but I do most of the things. Copy and paste, I remember that one, all right? Uh, but most of the other ones, uh, I, I, I'm a mouse user. I, I, I think I put in my time with punch cards and using keyboards long enough that I deserve the break of using a mouse, so I, I use a mouse for that. And again, this can benefit people that love to use a mouse. Uh, I'm sorry, people that love to use a keyboard as opposed to a mouse, but it can also benefit people that have those issues. So this, I would argue, is a form of multiple presentation, an alternative way of doing something or viewing a particular content. All right, what's another disability? Uh, oh, epilepsy. What's the issue with epilepsy? Flashing lights, flashing animations, all right? Flashing animations can trigger uh, seizures, all right? Now, does that mean every animation will trigger a seizure? No. Uh, I'm not an expert in the matter, but I know certain rates can do it. There's a range of rates. We could probably find out uh, more details about it. OK. Okay. Right, right. Okay, wow. Uh, it was a uh, student told of the Incredibles had a flashing color wheel that, that uh, caused an issue because it, it triggered uh, seizures. Um, that's why you see in a lot of places, if you go to uh, an attraction or if you go to a concert, or a video game, there'll be a warning that says this has flashing lights, blah, 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 uh, warning people if you have epilepsy. Um, what could we do on a website for this? What, what is our answer for handling this sort of situation on a website? Keeping in mind that it very well is going to fit in one of these two themes, or maybe there's something we can do in each of those two themes to keep it from being a problem. Pardon me? Yeah, maybe there's something we could do with the animation to make it less likely to trigger things. I guess that doesn't fit in really one of these categories, but using safer colors, safer animation rates, that might be one possibility. What are some other possibilities? Yeah, uh, disable the animation and possibly give an alternative to the animation. All right? <coughs> If you remember, um, I said way back at the beginning that, that a lot of times people kind of turn their nose up at accessibility and say, well, that's going to be like, quote, dumbing down our site. You know, we're going to remove content that could be beneficial for other people just because of certain people have epilepsy or whatever. I totally disagree with that because what you could do is you could provide an alternative. Um, if there was an animation, let's say you were an educational website and you wanted to show cell mitosis, whatever that is, all right? Or you wanted to show, um, you wanted to show some process or something where there was an animation and you think there was a potential for problems with it, all right? What could you do instead? Yes.
Okay. All right, multiple presentation. You could give people options to how to view it. Maybe view it with, different, uh, with a different color filter over it. That would be one. All right, a warning. Don't have it automatically uh, 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 play, for one thing. And what would you do, but like, okay, students still have to get that material, let's say, if they, this is a biology website. So what would you do instead of having the animation? Yeah, maybe a series of pictures, a series of static pictures that would explain it. Again, alternate presentation, all right, multiple presentation. For people that are able to view the video, uh, or I'm sorry, not the video, but the animation, uh, they can click on the animation and they can see it. Uh, maybe you can customize that animation uh, if that will help, or maybe you provide an alternative to say, okay, if you know that you're prone to seizures and you're concerned about this, go and visit, visit this page instead. All right? Brightness option, all those sorts of things could come into play. What does simplicity have to do with this particular disability? Might be a little less obvious, but what does simplicity have to do with it? Well, simplicity has to do with don't put the animation in unless it really adds value to the page. Keep it simple. All right? Or at the very, yeah, if it is necessary, put a warning, give options, and so on. But if it's not necessary, don't put it in. If it doesn't add something to the page. Exactly. They don't, they don't think about that at all. Uh, yes. Uh, let's look for, let's look for that. So, anime. I'm trying to think of what to Google for here. I'm going to website accessibility animation alternative content. Let's see if this. All right, there, here's some recommendations. There's a good place to start for basic accessible. In a nutshell, there's two recommendations. Uh, first is to pa have a pause control for any animation that starts automatically and plays more than five seconds. Second is not to have screen flashing more than three times a second. Providing alternate content. See if there's an example here. Okay, let's see this. <laughs> Swell. Yeah, that's the alternative. Display a page saying the link not found. Um, right.
Right. See, this will get CEOs' attention if they don't take uh, accessibility seriously. Avoid lawsuits. Right. Um, that would be potential, too. I'll tell you, well, let's look at this one. This is Section 508 relates to the page not found. <laughs> Six design alternatives to avoid evil slideshows. This is, this is a creator of PowerPoint, by the way. Keep in mind that they're, they're bringing up other issues with, with animations. Animations, even forgetting the epilepsy issue, uh, what about people who can't see them? All right, um, that's an issue right off the bat. So you need alternatives for that as well. Um, lack of motor skills, you know, how do you, how do you pause it and so on. Display a grid of images. That is. All right, let's see. Cycle through, get that racket off. All pieces. Let's see what that does. Really look like that. Get that racket off. Oh, that turns the sound off. That's a good question, by the way. Um, I'll tell you what, if you find it and put it on your web page for accessibility, that will automatically probably qualify you for full credit. <laughs> All right? If you put that on there. Because I, I don't see one, I don't, you know, uh, I don't want to spend more time looking for it. But I would think, if, if I was doing this, you know, I would have a series of static images with a text explanation. That would be the alternative. That would cover the um, that would cover the issue of people that had issues with the animation because of, of, of seizure potential and that would cover the fact that some people couldn't see the images. Uh, the text part of it would. Um, okay. What, what else? What are other disabilities that could affect someone's ability to access the web. Narcolepsy? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good, that's a new one on me. Website, narcolepsy, uh, accessibility. Yeah, it does not really, it talks about narcolepsy in the narcolepsy website, but it doesn't really have examples um, of things that you can do. Yeah, that might be one that you simply can't do anything about, right? Um, 
another one. Colorblindness, yeah, we did talk about that, and we talked about the colorblind filter last time as well, where you can view how a page looks like, keeping in mind that uh, there's not one colorblindness issue. It's not as though people that are colorblind see in black and white. All right, and what you can do there is use good contrasting colors. You could also give people a choice between colors. All right, that would be another way. And again, both of those are forms of multiple presentation. Additionally, don't only use colors to signify something. So if something's important, don't just put it in red. Put it in red and make it bold. Put it in red and put it in italics or something like that. Another example. Here's one that's very misunderstood by people, um, and that is dyslexia. What is dyslexia? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, it's a pretty good uh, definition. Uh, it essentially is, is uh, if I was going to give a very short definition of it, I would say there's confusions with letter shapes. And that could invo involve letters moving. That could involve letters being confused for other letters. Um, a lot of people, like in popular culture, think uh, dyslexia is simply that letters slip around. Like you'd see the letters of, you know, a word. Instead of word, W-O-R-D, you'd see D-R-O-W. That's, that's not the case, all right? But someone with this dyslexia might confuse a D and a B, a lowercase d and a B, because they're the same, they're just turned. Or they might confuse an N and a U, because an N is sort of a U that's upside down. There's a really good site <coughs> that shows you what it's like to be dyslexic. Okay, that's a good analogy. Here is a dyslexia simulation. Welcome to blah, 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 begin dyslexia overview and simulation. All right, how is dyslexia experience? It's different for each person, right? It might reverse D for B. You might have some letter reversal. Pit becomes tip. M looks like W. Felt and left. At, to, said, and, and so on. All right, here's a... Here's a uh, simulation and try reading the material. I, I'm assuming no one in here, ha does anyone have, well I, I guess you don't have to say that, but do keep in mind that if you do have dyslexia this, this might uh, be a different experience for, than for people who, who do not have that. Alright, so let's, let's see if you can read this. You have a minute to do that. All right, here's questions you have to answer. Why are images good for web accessibility? That was in that paragraph. Right. 
Right, because in, in a nutshell, the images can help put the text in context and assist with that. Who would negatively be impacted by a text-only site? People with dyslexia. Here's the unmodified paragraph. Would a web-only site be of ideal for someone with a reading disorder? Hardly. Images are not bad. What most people don't know, though, is there's much more to accessibility of an image than alt text. Some people wrongly assume images are, since alt text essentially replaces the image with a text-only version. All right, here's some things you can do for people with dyslexia. Consistency, all right? Um, it's interesting that uh, a lot of years ago, um, I worked as a tutor tutoring adults uh, with reading, adults that weren't able to read, all right? It's amazing what people that are not able to read can do. Why? Because they, they get pretty clever at figure things out without reading, all right? In other words, they get used to understanding that certain things are in a certain position, all right? And they see pictures that go along with things, like, for example, on a menu. They might point to a picture and say, oh, I have that. Or they might know that a certain document is structured a certain way, and so on. Well, one thing we can do on our websites is be consistent about the way the page looks. So if you have a navigation, all right, and you make it work a certain way, you can really help people that are dyslexic, all right? Typically, the first link in a navigation scheme is home, right? So don't think, well, I'm going to be creative and I'm going to put it the fifth link on there. No, what's the point of that? There's places to be creative, but there's places to sort of like be consistent both with yourself and with other sites on the web. So menu tabs are one consistent navigation scheme that can help people out. Now, again, the question I would ask, who likes an inconsistent navigation scheme? No one. So you could do it and say, well, I'm doing it for accessibility, or you could do it and just say, well, I'm doing it because it just makes sense. It's a good design. Organize information in manageable chunks, all right? Don't have long, long paragraphs. Use bulleted lists. Use a combination of lists, and, uh, text, and uh, uh, images. Have the stuff on the page logically organized. Again, who wants it illogically organized? Give your images a context, all right? So in addition to the text, have a map, is what they're showing here. In addition to text, have an image. Printable versions, so that they can read it on their own time. User control of certain things. Give options and additional resources. There actually is a special font for people that, that's uh, supposedly uh, helps people with dyslexia. And here are the suggestions. They suggest avoiding a white background. Use a plain, evenly spaced, sans serif font. Alternatives include 12 to 14, dark on a light, avoid red and green. Use bold instead of italics and underlining. Avoid block capitals. boxes and borders, short, simple sentences,
This is getting in sort of the technical part of the letters, good ascenders and descenders. Ascenders are like the lines that go up and the lines that go down. Good letter spacing. RN should not look like a, a, a letter M. And so on. There are some fonts specifically designed with people for dyslexia and um, they might be worthwhile considering too. We just have a couple more to wrap up and then we'll start on the next topic. Um, I don't want to go too long over time today, um, so we'll wrap up here. We'll wrap up just a couple of more things about accessibility on Monday of next week and then we'll get into the next topic, which if I'm not mistaken is forms. All right? So. Uh, we'll talk about that next time. Um, if that causes you to be late on the assignment that's due next week, um, that's okay with me. All right? Um, so we'll talk more about that next week. All right, we'll see you up in lab.